Imagine that we brought back Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone, and we showed him our cell phones. This is George Crabtree, senior scientist at Argonne Labs and amateur necromancer. His reaction would be, what's that? That's not a phone. He'd be baffled. Now bring back Thomas Edison and show him the grid as we have it now. He would instantly recognize every feature of that grid. He'd say, oh, I understand that grid. I know how it works. I know where the electricity goes. Uh, in fact, I can run the grid for you if you like. That just shows that one industry has changed dramatically. It's really changed in the last 20 years. The other, the grid, hasn't, but it will change. It may be five to 10 to 15 years off, but I think it will come. So your goal is to confuse the ghost of Thomas Edison when he comes back. Exactly. Okay, okay, why are we talking about the ghost of Thomas Edison? Because the electricity grid is in need of a major overhaul. It's inefficient, it's wasteful, and it could just be better, okay? In a lot of ways, the technology of our grid is stuck in the 19th century with good old Thomas Edison. We need to bring it forward into the 21st century, and to do that, we need to leave behind the old grid like we've left behind this guy. For this guy, today we've got smartphones. Tomorrow, give or take a decade, we'll have a smart grid. What you doing? I'm playing Angry Birds. A smart grid will really confuse the hell out of Thomas Edison, right? Right. And Crabtree is spearheading that confusion effort at the Joint Center for Energy Storage Research. Which can be pronounced J. Caesar. J. Caesar is a research partnership between various academic and industrial labs and commercial manufacturers with the expressed goal of getting out the next generation of battery technology and increasing our ability to store energy. This is a storage moment. We've suddenly realized with the new emphasis on climate change, that it's going to be a tough road to eliminate carbon from our economy. We don't have the technology for it. Most of the carbon emitted into our atmosphere comes from transportation and electricity generation. That's because most of our cars run on gasoline and most of our power comes from the burning of fossil fuels. These two together are about two thirds of the carbon emissions that the United States and every other country emits. So we want to cut down on our carbon emissions, but there's a minor complication. It doesn't matter how many solar panels or windmills we make, we're never going to be able to completely go green until we come up with a revolution in energy storage technology. That might sound like a daunting task, but we've done this before. In 1991, Sony came out with the first lithium ion battery, and almost every aspect of the way we live today changed because of it. Because of its small size and rechargeability, the lithium ion battery allowed us to carry around our computers and cell phones wherever we go, allowing us to be connected to instantaneous communication and information at all times. The lithium ion battery not only revolutionized the kind of technology we could have, it revolutionized the way we interact with each other. Can you say something? There's two more revolutions waiting to happen. One is with electric cars. The other one is with the grid. And large high density batteries like the one Jay Caesar is trying to develop could be the answer. For the stability and effectiveness of our power grid, energy storage is critical. If you break it down, there's basically two places where energy can be stored. First, we can set up a giant battery at the beginning of the grid, the power plant. But why, you may ask, would we want to store the energy a power plant produces? Well, we don't use energy consistently throughout the day. At night, when we go to bed, we use much less energy than when we're up and watching TV or microwaving Hot Pockets. If a power plant could store energy when we're asleep or when demand is low, we could balance the amount of electricity the plant would have to generate. And since electricity prices are often dictated by consumer demand, if we store and release energy as needed, we can lower the price of electricity during times of high usage. But this load balancing is really important for renewable energies like wind and solar. Because they get their energy from sources we can't control, the sun and the weather, their electricity production is highly variable. When a cloud comes over, by the way, that reduces the output of the solar plant by 70%. Likewise, if it isn't windy, our wind turbines don't work so well either. But if you have a battery nearby your wind turbine or your solar array, you can store up that energy when demand is low and save it for when it's not very sunny or it's not windy. For solar power, this is especially important during sunset. Which is the peak demand time. Everybody's home from work. They're turning on lights, turning on televisions, starting to do things at home. So there's lots of reasons to put storage centrally. There are also lots of reasons to put it as they say, at the edge of the grid. In other words, in your home. Now this is where the grid can start acting like your phone. And when we start to confuse the crap out of Thomas Edison. So like old timey landlines where you can only make or receive calls, our current grid only lets you turn things on or off. And dim, if you're in the mood, and if you have a dimmer switch. Sure, but that's basically it. A battery lets you have more control. So if I have a solar panel on the roof, 
and I have a battery in the garage, then if I'm gone all day at work and my solar panel's generating electricity I can't use, I store it. So now you have a lot of options thanks to your home battery. Say you come home at sunset, you could start turning on all your TVs and microwaves and using that energy you saved up throughout the day without being a burden on the electrical grid. Or you can choose not to use it and all that clean energy you got from your solar panels could be given back to the grid or even sold to your local utility company. Make a little scratch on the side. Or you could do both. You can customize your energy use by controlling a battery with a computer or more likely an app on your phone. Which controls how much energy I get from the sun, how much I put in my battery, and how I use that energy. So all three of those things would be controlled. Much the same way that I personalize my cell phone to do the functions that I myself need. This gives the consumer a lot more power over his own energy profile. Pun, pun intended. Indeed. Power. As of right now, there are some home batteries on the market and a few ways of storing energy on a large scale. The most popular method in the United States, by a wide margin, is pumped hydro storage. During low demand times, surplus energy from a power plant is used to pump water into large elevated reservoirs. When demand for electricity is high, the reservoirs are drained and the pressure from the water spins a turbine which produces electricity. In fact, you can think of these giant reservoirs as a type of battery, where the energy is stored in the form of the gravitational potential energy of the water. Other methods of energy storage include pumping compressed air into underground caves, storing energy as heat in molten salts, spinning flywheels, and of course, large battery grids, like this one recently built in Hokkaido, Japan. Pumped hydro and compressed air storage work great, but they suffer from the limitation that you need either a large water source and high elevation, or a giant underground cave. Batteries, on the other hand, can be kept anywhere and provide near instantaneous power when needed, but there's a problem. They're great for phones and small electronics, but for large scale applications like cars and the power grid, lithium ion batteries are very expensive. If clean energy is ever going to be able to compete with coal and gasoline on a global scale, we're going to need a new kind of battery. George, you're our only hope. Well, you're one of several hopes. So you need to make the battery about a factor of five less expensive than lithium ion. That's a huge jump. And you need to have an energy density about a factor of five greater. So if you want to compete, it's these factors of five that you have to get. So the way the battery community works right now, the R&D community, those four functions, discovery, design, prototyping, and manufacturing, are done by completely different organizations in different places, quite often on different continents. We combine all of those into one really communicative organization. So Jay Caesar has not only a nice big lab like Argon working on developing these new batteries, there are several other labs working on multiple designs simultaneously. And these labs work in tandem with manufacturers who can mass produce them and hopefully get them to market sooner. I have no idea what you're doing, but keep up the good work. The key is getting that factor of five increase in battery life and storage. And thankfully there are several ways of doing this. We've already counted 18 different ways to design a beyond lithium ion battery. And that means there's probably more than one beyond lithium ion battery that will meet our stringent factors of five improvement goals. One of the main reasons lithium batteries are so expensive is the materials they're made of. So Argon National Laboratories and the other J. Caesar labs are experimenting with different materials like magnesium, aluminum, and even sulfur, all much more readily available and thus cheaper than lithium. We probably see improvements, you know, yeah. once every few months, ideally. Um, yeah. You know, we have a lot of people working on the project. Are you optimistic about what you're doing? You think you're gonna make an amazing battery someday? I mean, I, I think we can. Uh, you know, it, it's a big challenge to actually make these types of batteries to work. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of promise to it. No one's really explored the area before, so we're yeah. kind of the first ones in. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's why we see improvements. So I believe that the will is there. And it's sort of a global intention, a global will to solve this problem. It's not only in the United States. It's not only in the developing countries. It's really around the world. What do you think? Do you think batteries will revolutionize energy the way they've revolutionized phones? Would you consider putting a battery in your home and generating your own power? What would you say to Thomas Edison's ghost if you saw him in your bedroom? I would say, Aah! Let us know in the comments. Yay! Hey, thanks for watching. If you like this, consider clicking like and subscribing, and you can go check out our Patreon page if you want to support our show. Or if you really want to get involved, you can join our digital street team. You can click right up there. Last week, we what did we talk about last week? We talked about the grid last week, and you had a lot to say about it. You sure did. Too much. But we narrowed it down. Desmond Miller and Radic Gastwitz mentioned this new technique for storing energy using giant underwater balloons. It sounds kind of crazy, but it'd probably work on a smaller scale. And if you want to check it out, uh, we got a link in the doobly-doo. A lot of people commented on how if we just bring our energy sources closer to the consumer, we'll avoid loss. Well, 
This video should have hopefully addressed some of those concerns. Battery storage will hopefully one day fix this problem as more people put up solar panels, or wind power, or we figure out how to get power from our farts. That, a fart turbine. A furbine. Thanks for watching. Next week we're going to talk about nuclear power. Is it, is it nuclear or nuclear? We'll figure it out next week. Also, we talked with Derek Muller from Veritasium. He's a cool guy. He's a dreamboat. Yeah, he's a cool, cool drink of water. I think we've revealed too much about our feelings. How can you just sit there? Yeah, f you, Thomas Edison.